will be higher because uh, the value of uh, our guest then is that it's, it's usual we have not to faculty members, especially in this area, not to be students. Uh, so, uh, for those uh, to come here, uh, let me introduce Denis Volkov, uh, our guest, uh, who is currently uh, the research scientist in uh, Marine and Atmosphere Studies University of Miami. And this is like a something to understand what's going on in the ocean and that this is like in every science. So please feel free to interrupt me at any time if you want to ask questions and tell me if I am too silent. Because that happens. <laughs> I don't know. But, but, but I think that there were microphones. So, so I'm already silent. Okay, so I'm a physical oceanographer and uh, uh, my research interests are quite broad and here you see the list and it's basically all these research interests they overlap but my major research interest in satellite observations of sea level and uh, ocean circulation and these two quantities are related and in a minute I will explain why. So first of all I want to tell me what I'm going to talk about. So I'll start off with uh, explaining why we study sea level. Then I'll move to uh, explaining the sea level budget. So basically what contributes to sea level changes in the ocean. I will say how we observe sea level and uh, say something about global and regional sea level change as of now. And then I will present you uh, some selected case studies so that you will, by the end of this talk, you will have an idea of what I and my colleagues do. Um, so why study sea level? Well, first of all, sea level is a very important uh, climatic parameter because this is an integral, integral parameter of the state of the ocean and uh, an indicator of uh, climate variability. So the time series of sea level are characteristic of uh, changes of oceanic heat and salt content, changes in the ocean mass, changes in the ocean circulation, and other processes of atmospheric, uh, terrestrial, and cryospheric origin. So, of course, we all understand that sea level rise impacts uh, human populations in coastal and island regions, and there are about 50% of the global population that resides uh, near the coastline. So, one of the concerns if, for example, the Greenland ice sheet melts completely, then the sea level will rise by 6 meters, which will be a disaster for the current 
saving in billions of people. And uh, so here, this video uh, from NASA shows uh, the observations for the last decade, how the Greenland ice sheet uh, has been retreating. And you see there is a, like a steady negative trend of the Greenland ice mass. So of course it's decreasing uh, stronger near the coast. Another concern is uh, a potential collapse of the West Antarctica ice sheet, which is located around here. So if this ice sheet collapses into the ocean and eventually melts, then the global sea level will rise by three meters, which is also quite it's a big number. So and rising sea level means that uh, some weather events like storm surges or hurricanes they start representing uh, uh, they start bringing uh, more damage to coastlines to cities like here you can see a flood in Miami because of the hurricane uh, this is this is a flood in St. Petersburg and Russia before the dam was built but if the sea level is rising then it means that all these dams they have to be strengthened all the time and rising sea levels they also represent a problem for coastal um, ecosystems like here you see uh, some storm surge in the Sea of Azov in Russia. All right, another, another reason why we study sea level, because sea level is a very important dynamic variable. And uh, satellite altimetry observations of the oceanic topography give uh, the surface geostrophic current. So this is because flow in the ocean is almost in exact geostrophic balance. Um, that's, why, uh, that's when the Coriolis force is balanced by the pressure gradient. So that <coughs> geostrophic currents are easily computed from satellite altimetry. And in this uh, picture, you see the uh, ocean topography in the Gulf Stream region. So red means elevated and blue is the depressions. And so that the Gulf Stream is directed along this sea surface height gradient. And you can clearly see the eddies that are generated by the Gulf Stream, the uh, cyclonic eddies, anti-cyclonic eddies on the other side. So what is the sea level budget? So sea level anomaly, which is a deviation of sea level from some mid state, which I denote here as SLA, is a uh, composed of the steric component and mass component. Steric component is changes due to uh, changes in the volume of water column because of changes of its density. And density is determined by the changes in density are determined by temperature and salinity. So this steric component can be further decomposed into the thermosteric and halosteric. Thermosteric is only due to changes in temperature and halosteric is due to changes in salinity. Another part is the mass-related component. So it's basically when we add more water to the ocean or we remove this water in the ocean. And this is mainly caused by the wind-driven divergence, convergence, convergence in some regions, or to freshwater fluxes, which is precipitation, evaporation, or the All right, so these illustrations show how these different sea level budget components are measured nowadays. So historically, uh, sea level is measured by coastal tide gauges, but since about two, two decades ago, it's now a satellite altimetry that has a nearly global coverage. The steric component is measured by Argo flows uh, that are plentiful in the ocean at the moment, and historically also from uh, ship measurements. The mass related component is measured by grade satellites, so I will explain each of them shortly. Alright, so sea level is measured by satellite altimetry. So this picture shows the basic principle of satellite altimetry. So basically, we have a satellite on orbit 
that emits uh, signals to Earth and then receives echo. So this uh, the travel time, the round trip travel time is precisely measured and scaled by the speed of light, it yields the range, which is the distance between the satellite and the sea surface. So then the range is corrected for uh, atmospheric refraction and sea state biases. The satellite altitude is determined relative to a reference ellipsoid, which is a rough approximation of the Earth's surface. And this is basically a sphere flattened at poles. So, when we subtract altitude from the range, we get the sea surface height relative to a reference ellipsoid. So, the sea surface height is composed of uh, the height of the geoid, the height of the dynamic topography, the ocean dynamic topography, this is the quantity oceanographers are most interested in, but also tides and the static effect of atmospheric pressure. So, more inverted barometer effect. When we increase atmospheric pressure by one millibar, the sea level goes down by one centimeter, approximately. So, because geoid is not known accurately enough at short wavelengths, so uh, that's why usually the mean sea surface height is subtracted, so we get this sea level anomaly value, which is rather uh, accurate. And we can measure sea level anomalies with precision down to 2 centimeters. So here you see the tracks of major satellite altimetry, uh, altimetry satellites. So ones from uh, NASA and CNES, Topics Poseidon and JSON series, and then European Space Agency, ERS-1, ERS-2, MESAT, and the present day SRAP mission, which is also in collaboration with an Indian Space Research Organization. They have different inclination and different repeat cycles. So repeat cycle for Autonomous Poseidon Jason is about 10 days, and this one is 35 days, which also imposes some constraints on the temporal and spatial resolution we can get from the satellites. Right. So another observational uh, system that provides us measurements of the ocean mass changes is the gray twin satellites. So GRAY stands for Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment and it basically consists of uh, two identical satellites that fly one after another uh, with a separation uh, between them of 220 kilometers and these satellites they accurately measure changes in their speed and distance between them and uh, so when we have two satellites flying one after another, and the first satellite encounters a gravity anomaly in the ocean, which can be like a, the, there is a buildup of water, which is driven by wind, or there is a sea mountain or something. Then the first satellite accelerates, um, the distance between the satellites increases, then the first satellite passes this anomaly, uh, the trailing satellite on its um, in its turn accelerates and so on. So by precisely measuring changes in this distance, it's possible to uh, derive the small variations in the Earth's gravity field that are then transformed into the monthly ocean mass anomalies. And these monthly ocean mass anomalies are represented in equivalent water thickness, so basically in centimeters. And they are provided separately for the land and for the ocean. So these changes of the monthly gravity anomalies, they occur mainly because of the hydrological cycle. So we have precipitation and evaporation over the ocean, we have redistribution of water between the ocean and land, so we have melting glaciers, and so this is all reflected in these grace measurements. And finally, another observational, very important observational system that gives us um, the steady component of the sea level change is Argo flows. So what is Argo flow? Argo flow is shown here. So this is basically like, it looks like a torpedo, maybe the same kind of iron. And it has a flexible bladder over here. So, and the, the float actually pumps oil in and out of this bladder. And by doing this, it changes its density. So when the bladder deflates, uh, density of the float increases and the float sinks. 
and when it inflates, the, the float goes up. So most of its lifetime, the float spent a depth of about 1,000 meters, where they drift for about nine days. Then the float descends to about 2,000 meters, and from there it starts profiling. It goes up, makes profile, measures temperature and salinity of the water column, then transmits data to a satellite, and then the cycle repeats all over again. So the lifetime of a float is about four or five years, which is about uh, 150 cycles. And this is how the typical profile of temperature and salinity looks like. So at the moment, as of 27th October 2015, there are about 4,000 floats in the ocean, and you see that Actually, the floats are distributed roughly every three degrees. All right, so this picture shows how the global mean sea level has been changing over the last 20 plus years. So you see that there is a steady increase in the global mean sea level at a rate of about 3.3 millimeters per year and uncertainty plus minus 0.6 millimeters per year. So, but when we look at the, uh, re at the re distribution of this trend, we see some uh, regional differences. And these differences reach plus minus 15 millimeters per year. And all these differences are due to ocean and atmospheric dynamics. So the sea level in the ocean is rising because the Earth receives more radiation than it means back to space. And all this radiation has to be stored somewhere. So most of it is stored in the ocean. And the ocean occupies about 72% of the Earth's surface. It has a great heat capacity. So the, this radiative imbalance is, uh, can be due to both to natural climate variability, but also to anthropogenic influence like the uh, increase of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So the question is whether with all available observations we have for the last 10 years, which is satellite altimetry, gravity, and uh, argon flows, if we can close this sea level budget. So we can explain all this change by all our measurements. And here you see uh, the blue curve shows the altimetry measurements of sea level for the last 10 years, 10 years, and the trend is a little bit lower than for the entire record, it's 2.78. Then you see the trend of the ocean mass, and the red curve here shows uh, the increase of uh, the steady sea level, which is due to uh, thermal expansion of sea level, basically. So the dashed black curve here shows the difference between altimetry and grace. When we subtract grace data from altimetry, we basically get the steady sea level over the entire ocean depth. And you see that this steady sea level is almost fully accounted for by uh, steady changes over the uh, other 2,000 meters that are measured by Argo flows. And so the question was whether uh, there is any significant deep ocean points or if all the heat is stored in the upper 2,000 meters. And this picture actually shows if we subtract uh, grace and uh, Argo data from, so the mass-related sea level and steady sea level from altimetry sea level, then we get uh, the steady contribution of the deep ocean, which is below 2,000 meters depth. And as you can see here, so this is the resulting curve, there is no significant trend. So which means that on, on the global scale there is no significant deep ocean warming observed. So this was the work of uh, colleagues of mine from JPL, and then I and my colleagues in the lab I am here, I am at the moment, we decided to go a little bit further, so we decided to look at regional trends and find out whether regionally there is likely there is regional deep ocean warming. And this map shows the difference between altimetry and grace, which gives the steady 
sea level trend, steady over the entire uh, depth of the ocean. And you see that most of the change has been taking place in the South Indian and the South Pacific Oceans. So I put here two boxes, box A and box B. So these curves show the heat content averaged in these boxes. And what can be seen here, so the upper one is for the South Indian Ocean and the lower is for the South Pacific and for different depth ranges. So the first column shows the entire um, from, zero point, uh, from 0 to 2,000 meters depth, so the entire water column measured by Argo flows. Then the second column is from 0 to 1,000, from to 1,000, and the last one from 1,000 to 2,000. And what can be seen here that the warming in the Indian Ocean is limited to the upper 1,000 meters. While in the Pacific Ocean there is significant warming below 1,000 meters, between 1,000 and 2,000 meters depth. So now if we go back to satellite data, so we have, the, now we focus only on the South Pacific. So we have altimetry, sea level, Increase in, in the box B that I showed before. This is the grace data, there is almost no trend. So when we subtract altimetry from uh, grace from altimetry, we get this red curve which shows the steady sea level change in the box B in the South Pacific. And the steady over the upper 2000 meters measured by Argo is shown by these curves over here. Right, several curves because I used different data products from different processing centers so that we get more robust results. And when we subtract this Argo derived static upper 2000 meter static sea level from the total static for the entire ocean, we can get we get this uh, uh, set of curves. So this is the contribution of the deep ocean from 2000 to, to the bottom. And you see that there is a significant trend. So basically, the ensemble average trend is 3.2 plus minus 1.7 meters per year, so which is significant. And all these results are summarized in, in this table. So there are differences, but using also different data sets. There are three data sets for the GRACE data from, diff uh, from three different processing centers, and three for the Argo data. OK, so why? So we see that there is likely deep ocean warming inferred as a residual. But we want to understand why this happens. So what is the mechanism of that? So and in order to understand the mechanism, I, I have to first introduce to you some uh, basic concepts of the wind driven ocean circulation. So here in this map, you see the average wind speed and direction in the southern hemisphere. So we have strong westerly winds over the southern ocean then we have trade winds in the equatorial region uh, flowing, uh, blowing westward. And our box in the South Pacific is located right in between. So steady winds over the sea surface, they uh, create a rather thin maximum 300 meters uh, uh, upper mixed layer. And in this mixed layer, uh, so if wind is directed, so this is for the northern hemisphere case, so the surface current is directed 45 degrees to the right of the wind direction in the northern hemisphere and to the left in the southern hemisphere. And uh, in this mixed layer, the balance is between the Coriolis force, the wind stress, and friction. So then at depth, Going deeper, sorry. going deeper, the, wind, uh, the, the speed of the current decays exponentially and the current rotates. But what is important is that the net transport is to the right of the wind direction in the northern hemisphere and to the left in the southern hemisphere. So, associated with this uh, Ekman transport, this is so called Ekman transport, is the Ekman pump. So what happens in the subtropical gyres, this is again for the northern hemisphere, just as the only cartoon I could find. But in order to 
imagine how it looks like in the southern hemisphere, you just need to um, reverse the arrows here. That's it. So when we have westerly winds, in the southern hemisphere, for example, westerly winds over the southern ocean, and easterly winds uh, in the equatorial regions. So these winds, they drive uh, Ekman transport, which is directed to the left of the wind direction in this case. So northward over here and south southward over here. So this situation creates convergence, Ekman convergence. And Ekman convergence uh, makes the isopignals or surfaces of equal density to dome down and that leads to vertical uh, velocity, which is called the Ekman path. Okay. So now let's see what's going on in our box. So this is what I'm showing here by color. This is decadal trend of the cumulative Ekman pumping over the entire decade. And you see that there is a strong Ekman pump being located right in within the box here. And there it is associated with the increase of westerly winds over the decade in the Southern Ocean and strengthening of uh, trade winds over here. And if we compare uh, the cumulative Ekman parking in this box with the uh, heat content, we see that this uh, curves are uh, strongly correlated. So now let's see, at, uh, let's look at the uh, vertical profile of temperature uh, of the linear trend of the temperature anomaly. So this is like, this is longitudinally averaged uh, section. So here you have uh, latitude and this is depth. And so the section is split. So if this goes from uh, zero to 500, this is from 500 to 2000. This is just because the color scale is different. But what you can see here that this is like, uh, this shows you the warming right in the location where this box is located. And what is also interesting to um, notice here is that so these uh, contours show isotherms, and this is the linear trend of isotherms. So the black contours, I don't know if you can see them, but there are black contours also, and they indicate the isotherms in 2005, so 10 years ago. And the white ones are for the last year, 2014. And we see that the white isotherms are deeper than, than the black ones. So, which actually supports our hypothesis that this is caused by the act of pumping and just the entire thing goes down. All right. So, the conclusion here is that um, the Ekman convergence and Ekman pumping uh, deepen the isotherms below the Layer, they are responsible for this deep ocean one that can go even below the thousand foot depth. All right, so now let's move to a completely different region from South Pacific. Uh, we go to the uh, subtropical South Pacific to the subtropical North Atlantic, and uh, I will show you another interesting feature there. So, subtropical. Subtropical North Atlantic is features of the so-called Azores current. So this is the current that originates from the Gulf Stream and then flows eastward towards the Gulf of Cadiz over here in the Strait of Gibraltar. So this picture shows the mean dynamic topography based on 15 years of altimetry uh, and altimetry observations and also in situ observations and trace measurements. And you can see that the Azores current which flows here and there is a meridional uh, sea level gradient as well. So this current was, observed, uh, was well established, the existence of this current was well established only recently in the, in the 1980s and well confirmed only after the advent of satellite altimetry. So this plot shows you the absolute velocities in the Azores current. And so the mean velocity is, uh, on average, it's just above 10 centimeters per second. 
and the east of transport is 10 Hells Felder. So one Felder is uh, 1 million cubic uh, meters per second. And the most, most of the transport is concentrated in the upper 1,000 meters. So pe people were wondering, so why this uh, current is in this place? Because, for example, other subtropical gyres in the, uh, the Gold Ocean they do not have such strong and deeply penetrating currents. So then there was a hypothesis for this, uh, for the formation of this current. And this hypothesis is uh, related to so-called beta boom mechanism. So what happens here is that the Azores current flows uh, towards the Gulf of Cadiz. But what happens in the Gulf of Cadiz is that there is so, okay, I'll start from the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean Sea uh, has a very strong evaporation that exceeds uh, precipitation and evaporation. So, Mediterranean forms very dense saline water that outflows from the Mediterranean. And then here comes the Azores current that brings North Atlantic Central water. And part of this water flows into the Mediterranean above Mount Sverger. And above Mount Sverger outflows from the Mediterranean and descends down the continental slope over here. And this water drains the upper lying North Atlantic Central water and, and the rate of this entrainment is also about unsphere. So the beta film mechanism says that this vertical so I'm not going to talk too much about this, but it's just just the concept that any vertical motion in the ocean like vertical velocity is compensated by um, the recirculation. So basically, in the northern hemisphere, when we have a sinking water over here, then it requires northward flow just above the sinking region, and then there is a cyclonic recirculation. So um, the idea is that the Azores current represents one branch of this recirculation. So we decided to test this hypothesis, but the, the hypothesis is is uh, based on idealized models. And uh, we decided to test this hypothesis using state-of-the-art ocean general circulation model. And this is ECHO2 times regulation. ECHO2 stands for estimating the circulation and climate of the ocean phase two project. And this is ECHO2 configuration of Massachusetts Institute of Technology uh, general circulation model. So we use this global model. The global model uh, is represented on a cube sphere grid. So, so the globe is represented as a cube with six faces. So you see the spaces here. So we ran a number of experiments on nested domains. So we took a nested domain, which is here, the Azores current, just to save computational resources. And we ran some experiments. So these are the experiments. So first there is a baseline uh, experiment. So this is just a global model run, optimized solution, and then the experiments on the model that we uh, number it from 1 to 3. So in experiment 1, we closed the Strait of Gibraltar, so that all of there is no Strait of Gibraltar, and consequently there is no outflow from the Mediterranean, and no train. And the wind forcing was uh, set realistic, so from atmospheric analysis. Then, in the following experiment, we, there was a realistic exchange between the uh, Mediterranean and the North Atlantic, but the wind forcing was taken constant, just the average for 1992. And for the last experiment, again, we used the realistic exchange between, uh, between the Mediterranean and the North Atlantic, but there was no wind forcing on over this uh, nested so these experiments are designed to answer the following question. So first, what is the mechanism for the formation of the Azores current in the model? And specifically, would the Azores current exist if there is no, if there is no Mediterranean outflow? And the second, how does the wind force and its variability influence the Azores current? So would the Azores current exist without the local uh, wind force? All right, so these are the results of the experiment. And in this column, I'm showing the Azores current transport 
in swap jobs. And here is the entrainment in swap jobs. And this plot shows the entrainment. So here you see the uh, vertical coordinate shows depth, and the horizontal coordinate is the vertical transform. And you see that in experiment one, then when the uh, straight was closed, so there is no entrainment. Vertical change is almost zero. Uh, in experiment two, entrainment is the same like in experiment zero, so uh, the variability of wind doesn't change entrainment that much. When there was no wind forcing, the entrainment is uh, slightly reduced by about 25%, but, and the transport is also reduced. So, what you can see here, so this is the experiment one, when the strait of Gibraltar is closed. So, the Azores current is injected into the domain by the boundary condition, but you see how the current decays over the uh, model run. So, basically, the current is injected into the domain, but then it doesn't know where to go, so there is no force on the eastern boundary. So here you see the uh, aging kinetic energy of the Azores current. So this is a, a average over the from 100 to 800 meters depth, and this is for the sorry, for the uh, for the baseline solution experiment zero, and then you see how there is no almost no aging kinetic energy very low. So no Azores current. In experiment two, when uh, uh, there was a constant wind, we see that the eddy kinetic energy is reduced. But when there is no wind, so the Azores current still exists there, even without wind. But its variability is, is greatly reduced. So the conclusion is that there is no Azores current when the state of Gibraltar is closed, but the Azores current can exist without wind forcing, and wind is responsible for. Uh, partly responsible for the variability of the current. Okay, so this was the model, but now let's look what, uh, uh, what's going on in reality. So these are the uh, satellite altimetry observations of eddy kinetic energy average of the Azores current and uh, uh, surface geostrophic velocity. So this is the time latitude diagram. So time over the horizontal axis, and this is latitude uh, over the vertical axis. And this is basically Eddy kinetic energy and surface geostrophic velocity averaged zone. So you see how there is a variability in the eddy kinetic energy, and usually uh, high values of eddy kinetic energy follow strengthening of the current. Um, and what we also observed is that there is a relationship between the eddy kinetic energy and surface geostrophic velocity and uh, atmospheric force over the region. And atmospheric forcing here is shown by the so-called uh, North Atlantic Oscillation Index. So first I, I need to tell you what it is. So the North Atlantic Oscillation is the leading mode of atmospheric variability of the North Atlantic. And it is basically, the index is basically the difference between the atmospheric pressure and sea level, uh, between the Azores High pressure center and the Icelandic low. So the high values of uh, Higher positive North Atlantic oscillation uh, mean stronger westerly winds at mid latitudes that bring uh, moisture to the north, northern Europe, and the negative uh, NAO or low NAO uh, means uh, that westerly winds become weaker. The storm track shifts south, brings moisture to the south Europe, to the Mediterranean region. And this uh, period is also characterized by very cold winters in, in the central and northern Europe. So what we did, we actually analyzed the upper layer frontogenesis. Uh, I'm not going to talk much about it, but just uh, show you that. Uh, so frontogenesis this is basically the time evolution of the meridional temperature gradient at the Azores front. So the Azores current is basically a front characterized by strong gradients in temperature. Just so, and uh, here you see the contributions to this uh, evolution of the internal density gradient. And this is basically Ekman convergence and advection. This is the meridional change in the Ekman pump. 
20 people, and also the regional change in the mass of this heat flux in the ocean. And uh, so the conclusion is from here, so we analyzed all these terms, and uh, I will just show you the conclusion, which is illustrated by this uh, cartoon. So when, the, when there is a stronger, uh, stronger subtropical anticyclone in the North Atlantic, uh, associated with positive North Atlantic oscillation, that creates a stronger Ekman convergence, similar to uh, the South uh, Pacific, actually. And that increases the meridional density gradient. So, increased meridional density gradient means stronger current. So, when the current becomes stronger, it becomes more stable, and then it generates eddies, so giving rise to anti energy. And the opposite situation occurs when uh, there is a weaker subtropical anticyclone in the North Atlantic, associated with negative NEO, weaker convergence, uh, smaller uh, meridional density gradient, a weaker current, and anti energy. Okay, so now. All right, so now let's sail from the. Uh, from the subtropical North Atlantic into the Mediterranean Sea and look what's going on there. So, uh, if you look at the sea level uh, average over the entire Mediterranean, so this is the uh, black curve over here, there is a strong seasonal cycle. Uh, this red curve is based on satellite altimetry measurements. The red curve over here, this is the mass changes from satellites. So if you subtract seasonal cycle from, from altimetry data, so seasonal cycle is basically the uh, thermal expansion, seasonal thermal expansion of uh, uh, the seawater. So if you subtract that, uh, you get that these two curves match pretty well. So this is the lower curve. Which means that all these non-seasonal uh, fluctuations of sea level are mass related. So this is basically due to uh, extra ocean mass due to net transport through the Strait of Gibraltar into, in or out of the Mediterranean Sea. And we were actually interested by these large anomalies that uh, happened in winters 2009-2010-2011, these two very strong peaks. And so we coupled this to uh, wind forcing near the Strait of Gibraltar, and we found that, uh, that this wind setup near the Strait of Gibraltar is responsible for these large anomalies. So this can lead to, uh, when we have uh, uh, eastward wind anomalies over the Strait of Gibraltar, so this eastward wind can push water into the Mediterranean, and uh, create this large anomalies. David? Yes. What, what are the units? Over here? No, no, it, it is... Uh, These are centimeters. Centimeters. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, so this is quite... It's about like 10 centimeters sample to use. It's a, it's a red relatively strong because this is... Uh, pay attention to this is uh, basic average. So, we decided to include in the analysis also the Black Sea and the entire Eastern North Atlantic. And so, we also coupled this to atmospheric pressure and wind. And so, this is basically coupled EOF uh, uh, analysis. So, this is a leading coupled EOF between the sea level from altimetry in the Mediterranean Black Seas and atmospheric pressure shown by color. And the associated wind pattern shown by uh, errors. And so this pattern explains 92% of the squared covariance. And the time evolution of these spatial patterns is shown by uh, the black and uh, red curves over here. So what you can see here that this pattern basically resembles the uh, energy of North Atlantic oscillation. So meaning that, and it is basically the negative anomaly. So and there is a lower pressure anomaly in the subtropical North Atlantic and higher anomaly in the subpolar North Atlantic. 
So this situation is characterized by anomalously anomalous uh, westward winds over the Strait of Gibraltar over here that, as I showed you before, can lead to this uh, uh, anomaly in the net of transport into the Mediterranean. But also, what you can see is that if we zoom in on this region, the same pattern is characterized by stronger uh, northward winds over the Aegean Sea. This is the Aegean Sea. And these winds can actually lead to storm surges near the Turkish Straits. And these storm surges, they change the sea level gradient between the Black Sea and uh, the Aegean Sea. What I should say is that the Black Sea, uh, in opposite to the Mediterranean, is characterized by a positive uh, freshwater flood. So there is a strong, uh, there is precipitation, there is a strong river runoff that about two times greater than evaporation. So there is a, the time mean gradient between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean, and there is a time mean outflow from the Mediterranean. So it's about 300 cubic kilometers per year. And uh, but these winds can potentially lead to uh, they can potentially decrease the outflow or even reverse. So So what is also interesting to note is we uh, pay more attention to the Black Sea and the Aegean Sea and we compare the uh, sea level average over these basins, we will find that uh, there is a strong correlation for the non-seasonal uh, signals. Yeah. Okay. For the non-seasonal signals and the Black Sea actually lags behind the Aegean Sea by uh, 22 days. And this means that so although there is a net, uh, there is an average outflow from the Black Sea, and it is known that the Black Sea sea level, uh, at least on the seasonal and Mediterranean time scales, it is dominated by freshwater fluxes. But this correlation of time lag means that the Mediterranean Sea also affects the changes of sea level in the Mediterranean also affect uh, month to month changes of the Black Sea. And here I have shown, so these are the uh, time series basically, uh, timeline, but here I'm showing the uh, coherence. So this magnitude is the coherence, gain, and the timeline phase. So, and this is computed for the, so the analysis was done for uh, two data sets, one based on the uh, merge satellite altimetry data from uh, up to four satellites, and you see the tracks over here. And what I'm showing here is just uh, the coherence between the sea level averaged over this track in red. This is the topics plus item and JSON track, uh, averaged over the GNC and over the Black Sea. So the time series are uh, coherent at periods uh, generally greater than um, one month. And the time lag changes from about two days at one month period to about 40 days at 200 days. And you see there is a gradual of the exchange. So what we did, we just, uh, so we wanted to answer the question, how does the Black Sea respond to the Mediterranean sea level fluctuations? And we actually used an analytical model, so we uh, not going to talk about details here. But we, in the, this is just a linear model where the sea level on the Mediterranean side is uh, uh, considered as a forcing. And we also used uh, sea level pressure and river runoff in the, the, in the Black Sea and, uh, and wind over the Turkish Straits as a forcing. And we actually estimated the amplitude response so using this simple model. And we came up with an amplitude response to the uh, sea level changes in the Black Sea relative to sea level changes in the Mediterranean Sea for different friction coefficients because friction is the major constraint here. Friction is the friction in the Turkish Strait, mainly friction in the Bosphorus Strait. And uh, so the most realistic friction coefficient. 
So the curves are the most realistic prediction coefficients are shown here in black. And if we match them to what we observe here, that we have a good match with the gain, but um, the phase is partially explained. Not all the phase can be explained by this model, but about like 30% of the time lag we can explain using just this model. And uh, so what does it all mean? That using this analytical model, we can partially explain amplitude and phase. And uh, we also we also estimated the amplitude response for the uh, for the uh, fresh water flux into the Black Sea, atmospheric pressure of the Black Sea, and uh, wind stress over the uh, over the Turkish Strait. And we see that the sea level on the Mediterranean side is still the major forcing component. But these uh, terms can also uh, have some impact. And basically, if they all have a phase, then uh, the effect is quite large, it's plus minus four centimeters, which can be considered as error bars. So, one important thing is that useful predictions of the Black Sea elevation in response to sea level fluctuations in the Mediterranean, EG and the Sea of Marmara, can be made from a few weeks to uh, a month in advance, and this may be of societal and economic benefit. Alright, so I think I will uh, just move to the computer screen. So let's keep this one. Okay, so just future perspectives. So, I mean, the general objective that I have in mind is, uh, is continue understanding the ocean dynamics and grow of the ocean in climate. But also, I'm planning to move to uh, finer scales, which is sub meter scale uh, processes that are scales uh, smaller than 100 kilometers. And uh, uh, this is in association with the planned SWOT mission, which is uh, planned for launch in 2020. And this mission will uh, provide you know, final resolution of oceanic features like forms, filaments, and so on. And this is very important because uh, most of oceanic kinetic energy is concentrated at these scales. Also, most of mixing is at this scale. So, uh, mixing deep water formation, and in order to understand uh, the physics of how the physics of the ocean circulation scales are very important. So, but also, these measurements will provide uh, uh, measurements of like hydrological reservoirs, like lakes, rivers, because the resolution will be sufficient. So, there are practical applications of that, of course. So in the ocean, there are probably more accurate ocean currents for marine operations. Uh, so there is benefit for climate and weather predictions. For fisheries, because fisheries also rely on uh, certain uh, fishery populations, they depend on the physical uh, parameters in the ocean, and especially uh, fish light, like uh, ocean fronts, for example, and the fronts will be uh, much better resolved with this high resolution multi-generation. Uh, also, coastal zone management. For the, so, for the land, it's totally possible to monitor floods and to manage water resources, river operations, like, for example, the navigations. The navigation along the river, they require uh, knowledge about the water level in the rivers, and that can be also provided by these measurements. And this, the finally, this is this, to study the rapidly changing Arctic Ocean environment. So I was, uh, I had a project which has now ended and it was uh, dedicated to studying sea level in the Arctic Ocean. And uh, so I am still interested in that topic, so I will be continuing. And uh, so you know that the Arctic environment is rapidly changing. There are rising temperatures, uh, very dramatic decline of sea ice melting Greenland ice sheet and erosion of coastlines because of sea level rise, changing in ecosystems and so on. So this is quite unfortunate, but uh, I mean there are side benefits, I put it in quotation marks. So that because there is less sea ice, so there is new horizons for navigation and resource development. So perhaps uh, monitoring and forecasting sea ice conditions for marine operations in the Arctic becoming more important and uh, 
Okay, so, and finally, just a concluding remark that I wanted to bring here as well as the like space, space center of school tech is that uh, there are many uh, oceanographic satellites uh, in the United States, Europe, so specifically dedicated oceanographic satellites. And unfortunately, you know, in Russia, there are only a few Earth observing satellites, at least a small number. Um, which is quite unfortunate because Russia is very small. So I thought that there is a need for dedicated oceanographic satellites because there are, not, there are never too many satellites because we need to increase the resolution, we need to continue monitoring of oceanic environment. And uh, it's also a kind of a uh, pity because now I see the drug. Uh, there is also Chinese oceanographic satellites already flying. Um, there is Indian oceanographic satellite in collaboration with European Space Agency. But no Russian satellite, so. <laughs> this is it. Thank you very much. already we have uh, at least two centers in Russia uh, which are doing the same kind of research uh, for instance uh, marine uh, hydrophysics institute in Sevastopol they are showing practically the same pictures and they are responsible for Black Sea and also other stuff and uh, if you will cooperate with them uh, what is original in your research what can you introduce in the, into this community well, Dive, uh, he gave me a presentation which is just to my course of remote setting just exactly exactly uh, the same picture they're considering themselves as a core Institute in this field, they are distributing these flows, movies, and we purchased already one. Uh, so, uh, what is what is new blood, fresh blood you are going to, uh, to, to deliver here? Yeah, so I would say that there are not just two centers, there are many centers in Russia, even there is a uh, Arctic and Antarctic Research Institute in St. Petersburg. Area of expertise in the Arctic Ocean. And there are universities, of course, Moscow State University, and also involved in uh, integration pro programs as well. So, uh, to answer your question, is that usually, you know, the Marine Hydrophysical Institute they focus on the Black Sea. So that's their, you know, their territory, and that's where they deploy their movies. And uh, I don't think they go any farther. So these other buoys, like I showed you, the harbor floors, they, uh, they are basically... That's well, this guy, Mat Matejov, is showing us this buoys, buoys distribution all over the world, and he's claiming that he is leader now uh, 
everybody is eager to buy buoy from him. <laughs> and it is more reliable than American buoys. Well, I think everybody would claim that. But as far as I know, that most of most of buoys that are deployed there, they come from either United States or France. So it's based the cyber flaws and the Jutan boost is one of them. Um, but yes, definitely, yeah, because we are studying the same processes, in fact, and maybe the differences between the uh, uh, between the uh, our focus areas, like Black Sea or for example Arctic Ocean, the Arctic people have more expertise in this particular region and this is the, it's very different from other ones, so it's... Do you know any practical applications? Other people don't care. <laughs> no, I mean, we have Okeanology Institute in Moscow, we have this Sevastopol Hydrophysical Institute, and uh, they usually uh, try to, uh, to cover everything. What is not covered yet? What, uh, where uh, we can participate in this science? Okay, so what is not, I think the Arctic is still the most you know, um, unsampled region in the, world, in the ocean in terms of satellite observations because there is sea ice, you cannot know in that, and so one expertise is just to use satellite data. And, looking at waveforms and uh, trying to uh, get sea level from leads in the sea ice, it's one And uh, also another problem with buoys in the Arctic, because you cannot put buoys there, because they cannot you know, surface and transmit data because of sea ice. So there's, there's, not, there's still you know, a lot of room to uh, in observations in the Arctic. And these observations are very expensive, so it requires international collaboration. You, you mentioned economic values, uh, and, and uh, you, you used the example of the Mediterranean. I had thought the Mediterranean is so small that the economic values of this could also be small. Change under an inch. Can, can you? Can you um, tell uh, some examples of what you think? Well, that's not really, it's not really small because if you, for example, if we look, if you can see that the global mean sea level change, so this change is uh, uh, like several centimeters change even. For some regions it can be a problem, like for example for the Nile they Nile Delta is an uh, agricultural area for Egypt, for example. And if you raise, like, I, I'm not sure if I remember the correct numbers, but I think if you raise the sea level by about 100 meters, then this will just inundate territories where the population, the population of about 3 million people, and this agricultural land. How many meters? Well, 50 centimeters, about 50 centimeters. So another problem is that, for example, in the Mediterranean, it's Malta. You know, Malta heavily relies on freshwater reservoirs, and rising seas mean that this freshwater can be contaminated by salt water. But, but simply for rising sea, I, I can also use a pole and, and measure every year. I don't need a satellite. Uh, yes and no. Because, uh, yeah, the tide gauges, you are right, the, the tide gauges is basically the historic instrument. That, but this is really a localized measurement. So uh, you do not know the global picture, of course. So it's all either in the coast, somewhere or on the islands. But, and there is, a, for example, in the Arctic now there is a problem because most of Russian tide gauges were closed in the 90s. And there is only a few tide gauges operation. So most of the information nowadays about sea levels is from satellites. And it's problematic because of the sea ice. So. Uh, 
That's a very good question. Yes, definitely. So what, what I was showing you um, for the subtropical South Pacific. So basically what is El Niño? El Niño is uh, uh, usually the we have a trade winds in the equatorial region that push warm water to the west. And this warm water accumulates in the Western Pacific. But then from time to time, it's usually from like every three, seven years, this trade winds weaken, and all this warm water goes eastward. And this brings a lot of storms, uh, moisture, um, for example, to the uh, west coast of the US and South America, and it has a great impact not just there, but also in so, what I was showing you in the subtropical South Pacific is that there is over the decade there was a trend in, in, in there was an increase in trade winds, increase in western areas that uh, led to this convergence and sea level rise in the subtropical South Pacific. So this year, this year is uh, is anticipated to be one of the So this increase of sea level, so El Nino happens when there is um, ocean mass accumulates over here, there's a lot of warm water, when there is a Nino, straight winds weaken, and all this water goes here. So what we expect now that this year is anticipated to be one of the strongest El Nino on record. So which means that uh, this trend may reverse over here. And for how long it will last, we don't know. But definitely, when you have a, a global sea level rise, all these fluctuations and internal variability mainly because of the Nino. And you see this deep over here? So this is the situation uh, opposite to El Nino. This is La Nina. And that's when you know, ocean lost mass, so there was redistribution of water between uh, ocean of land, so there was a lot of precipitation in some land regions, so the ocean actually lost this water and lost this city. So. Thank you very much. That's, thank you.